So I'm Chris Bradford. I'm from Datastax. I'm going to talk about bringing Cassandra closer to Kubernetes. Uh, I personally work on an open source project called Kate Sandra, which is all about running open source Apache Cassandra on Kubernetes. This talk is going to be a little bit different, though. I'm going to be talking about a technology that we built at Datastax to kind of merge the two together a bit more. One is the Kate Sandra is more about running, just running Cassandra on Kubernetes. Uh, but Cassandra is a number of years old at this point. It predates Kubernetes by, I want to say it was eight years. And so it has some things that it does internally that maybe we could leverage native resources inside of Kubernetes and uh, maybe a little bit vice versa. So first things first, I want to do a special thanks to my colleague, Jake Luciani. Uh, he's done a version of this talk for data on Kubernetes as well. Uh, and one, is one of our lead engineers uh, could not do this talk without him. So I want to make sure he got some nice credit. So what are we going to talk about today, though? First things first, I'm going to give you a quick intro to Apache Cassandra, what it does, kind of how queries come in, and, and, and the highlights of why Cassandra is an interesting database. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Astra Serverless, which is this version of Cassandra that we've de developed to run cloud natively and really with a bunch of the components of the cloud native ecosystem. We're going to map out how those components all relate to each other. And then finally, we, we're going to look at the life cycle of what we call a CQL request. Uh, CQL is the Cassandra query language. Think of it like SQL. Um, but just how you would, uh, how the queries move through the system and, and all that. I have a QR code up here for the Astro white paper. It goes into a lot more detail, has some really cool diagrams to kind of show how all these uh, systems work together. Um, highly recommend you go check that out. Uh, but let's get started. So first and foremost, the architecture of Cassandra. I, get, I got started with Cassandra back in 2013. I went to a Cassandra summit out in San Francisco, uh, and it, it changed, actually changed my life because I was just doing app development work back then. And uh, now I've been working with Cassandra well ever since. So at its core, Cassandra assumes it's running on a fixed, I don't want to say budget, but a fixed group of hardware. Certainly you can add and remove nodes, nodes will go down, nodes will come up, and what have you. Uh, but there's a bit of a process involved to add, add a node, remove a node, what have you. So for the most part, at any given time, your Cassandra is running on a fixed, fixed set of hardware. All nodes can do all things. It's peer to peer, so there's no uh, primary and replicas. It's all you can ask any node to service a query, and if it can't service that query, it'll pass it along to a node that can. We'll have some diagrams for that here in a second. Um, you can't independently scale the components, though. And what I mean by that is, if you think about data, compute, network, uh, with the data being more like storage, storage, compute, and network, I can't just say, uh, give me more of the processing side of this. I have to add another node, which is also going to increase uh, my storage capacity and what have you. If I need more storage, I have to add more nodes, regardless of the fact that queries may be running uh, just fine. Um, all the nodes talk to all the other nodes. Uh, all, if your driver will also open a connection to each node in the cluster. Uh, so there's a little bit of, uh, there's quite a bit of networking involved. Um, and one of the key points when we talk about uh, serverless infrastructure or how to make something a bit more scalable, we, we tend to think of multi-tenancy. And Apache Cassandra doesn't do that out of the box. You can have separate key spaces, but there's still a limit on like the total number of resources available to a cluster. Um, and I can't just say, I want to scale out this cluster for just this one user or just this one key space. When I scale out a cluster, it affects all key spaces, usually in a good way. But if you're talking about uh, budgets from different lines of business, that kind of thing, you don't get that independent scalability. Many users get around this by deploying separate clusters for various lines of business or various applications, but uh, it's just something that you kind of have to think about. And then does not auto scale. Uh, there are metrics that you can watch and you can write some tooling to do that automated scaling. But like I said before, adding and removing nodes can take a bit of time. Um, oh, of course my laptop screen just turns off, my apologies. Uh, it can take a little bit of time, so you could see, uh, I've seen nodes that are multiple terabytes in size. Adding a new node to that cluster can take over a day. And so um, auto-scaling, while possible, is going to take a, a significant chunk of time and, and, and resources, and maybe even some automation that you have to write. So let's talk about a Cassandra cluster. I said all nodes are created equal. Here we have six nodes. Uh, I'm going to just give it a name. This is in data center one. Uh, each of these nodes has storage on disk. Each of these nodes can receive queries. Um, we also have what's called a replication factor. So any piece of data that comes into the system is going to be replicated across three nodes. Uh, so that's, that's the first view. But let's add some application servers because it does make sense just to talk about a database. Uh, 
And then let's talk about a query coming into this cluster. So if we have a query coming from our app server, it goes into this node over here uh, on the left-hand side, well, the left-hand side of the ring. Uh, that node is a replica, and it's forwarding that, that data request over to other replicas. This was a read request. Uh, this node would receive the request from the client. It would ask for the data on the other replicas. It would make sure that everything makes sense, fix any inconsistencies, and then send it back. So essentially, whichever node receives that request is known as the coordinator node. It's responsible for coordinating that query. Any node can be a coordinator. Uh, there's some smart bits inside of the driver to make sure that we route directly to a replica to avoid extra network hops and all that fun stuff, um, but just at a high level. Now, if I, for some reason, choose a coordinator node that doesn't have data, you can see it still says, oh, I know where that data lives, and forwards it to the appropriate nodes. We can all see that. Yeah, we can all see that. So this even works in a multi-data center cluster. Cassandra is multi-region or multi-DC out of the box. Uh, so here I have a single Cassandra cluster that's separated across, let's just say, two regions. You could have uh, something in the EU, something in, in the US, and it'll replicate data. So here my application server is talking to DC1. It says, hey, I'm going to replicate my data to these two other nodes, but I'm also going to forward this request across the WAN to my remote DC, pick a coordinator over there, which will then be in charge of pushing the, the data to the appropriate replicas. Uh, this can happen synchronously or asynchronously. The developers, application developers, have a choice on how that all functions. Um, but it's kind of important to understand this kind of request flow, because when we talk about serverless, we're going to follow the same request flow and how it moves to the system. So uh, when we first started talking about scaling Cassandra, though, we, we created this project called Stargate. And Stargate effectively removed that coordination job from the Cassandra cluster itself into a stateless layer in the center. Uh, that way we can, uh, as we scale out the number of app servers, we can independently scale the compute or the query side of things while leaving the data side independent. Um, and Stargate plays a, a big role in uh, how we started to think about destructuring Apache Cassandra's database into multiple components. So how can we make Cassandra serverless? Or really, how can we shatter the monolith, if you will, of uh, Apache Cassandra? So we said, if we wanted to make a serverless Cassandra, we needed to be able to scale across different axes, whether that be scaling data independently of the number of, of coordinator nodes, uh, scaling the number of coordinators independent of the, of the data nodes, right? Um, reads versus writes, depending on what kind of workload we're seeing, we can scale uh, maybe types of instances or, or storage options. Um, we also wanted to be super elastic. So I mentioned it can sometimes take days to add or remove nodes. That's not really elastic in my eyes. I, I want to be able to add servers in, in minutes, not hours and days. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to, we, we've been looking at the Kubernetes ecosystem, and we actually started our, uh, our database as a service model on Kubernetes, where we were just running Apache Cassandra processes inside of containers. We said, there's a lot of stuff in this ecosystem that we could be leveraging to make this a better experience and maybe fix some of the issues we've had in Cassandra for years now. Um, and then finally, uh, have some operators that could aid us in doing these types of deployments um, and ultimately coordinating all these services. So, uh, but why would we want to do this? Uh, we want to use established cloud components, whether those are ones that we're deploying that are part of the cloud native ecosystem or ones that are coming from our cloud providers, like object stores, load balancers, that kind of thing. Um, again, we wanted to separate that compute from storage and split the separate storage engine components of Cassandra into smaller scalable services. And we have some of those here in the bottom right of the slide. I'm going to go into what each of those does and why they can be independent and what being independent brings to the table. And we said for a database as a service company, um, what does this give us, right? Well, we can transition from capacity-based pricing to usage-based pricing. So in our initial release of Astra, um, you would just tell us how many nodes you wanted or how much storage you needed. We provision a number of nodes and away you go. Now we can just say, we'll get you whatever resources you need. We'll scale to meet your workload, um, both up and down. That helps with uh, unit economics from our side as we're trying to run it on a reasonable amount of hardware, right? Versus a lot of hardware if we're using the, uh, the previous model. Um, optimize performance and, and give us a better operational story. So. Let's talk about the serverless services. So I mentioned Stargate previously. That works with open source Cassandra today. Uh, it works with uh, paid Cassandra offerings that DataSax has called DataSax Enterprise. Uh, 
Um, and it's interesting because it started as just a Cassandra node that was told, you don't want to join the cluster and have any data, but I want you to connect to all the other nodes of the cluster. And if you receive like a query, you can process that query. You just don't store anything yourself. Uh, and we layered a bunch of API services on top of that too. So HTTP APIs with uh, REST, GraphQL, this document interface. And then we said the data service though, is what these, the, the half of the node that wasn't doing coordination, it was just talking to disk, writing SS tables to disk, putting um, bits of data inside of memory, uh, reconciling when data was out of sync, and, uh, and ultimately uh, serving up saying, hey, this is the data from my replica. The compaction service is pretty fascinating uh, because Apache Cassandra uses uh, what's called SS tables. They are immutable by nature. So as soon as they're written to disk, they're never updated again. Uh, the downside to that is you have to get rid of old data as it's overwritten. So we have a process called compaction that takes many of these SS tables, compacts them together, getting rid of old data, and making sure everything stays in sync. So we, we took that out of the replica itself and made that its own separate service. Uh, there's some gotchas with doing that. We can talk about it here in a second. Next, we had this metadata service, and this is kind of fascinating. So one of the gotchas with, with Cassandra is when you get into larger clusters, uh, things can get a little weird. <laughs> I was working on a 300 node cluster for a customer. And when we would run a table change, it would take a little while for that schema to propagate around the cluster. So I'd say, hey, you have a new field in this table. And I'd run a, this separate command and I could watch and see, okay, these three nodes now have the new schema, four, five, six, okay, it's done. But if you didn't know that you needed to wait until it kind of had consistent consensus, and maybe you put all of your schema update, updates inside of a single file, you may send a command to add a column to this node over here and send a separate command to add a column to this node over here for a separate table. And now you have two different versions of the schema. And in some cases, it can reconcile that and get back to a good state. In other cases, uh, you have to do some command line wizardry to fix it. Uh, but that's no fun. So whether that's <laughs> not being able to push a bunch of schema updates at the same time or, uh, or having to just kind of wait between all these steps was, was frustrating, right? Uh, and so one of the things is we moved that metadata service to uh, etcd and said, hey, we're going to do our schema updates with etcd. It's going to give us that consistency that we're looking for. Um, and we can also watch it for updates at, at the node level. So we actually bricked that part of out, out of Cassandra. Uh, we also do some topology work with that, looking for when nodes add and join the cluster or are removed. Again, we can subscribe to those updates. And we don't have to maintain that ourselves. Uh, being that Cassandra predates Kubernetes, uh, it had to evolve some of these things over time. And it's interesting to see where some of what we've done has overlapped and also where the communities have kind of diverged. Uh, and then finally, object storage. We said, hey, storing all this data on disk is nice, uh, but it can be A, expensive, and B, if you're not touching a lot of this, it can be stored cheaper elsewhere. So we said, why don't we look at object stores as a method to do that? Uh, and then finally, operators, just to make the operational life easier. I've written a lot of Ansible and Puppet and all this code to manage on-prem uh, Cassandra clusters. I've also written a bunch of operators for it now, and I tell you, the operator lifestyle is pretty awesome. Just make me a cluster, and it's like, okay, I got you. So we wanted to embrace that. So, at a, so if we zoom out a little bit, these are all the services that we have inside of our serverless environment. And you can see a number of these are highlighted in orange because they are uh, cloud-native specific, part of CNCF, uh, or... Uh, adjacent, if you will, to metrics and Grafana are not part of the CNCF, but they're in the Prometheus space. And uh, that, that's actually where we started. So we're, we're using like Nginx for, for ingress and uh, working with SSL. Uh, I mentioned S etcd, but we have all these other services too. And because we uh, are separating all these out, we can manage them independently, scale them independently. And that, that results in a, a better experience for our users. So if we're if we go back to uh, looking at the services map, we can see kind of how these layers are all working together. So we have uh, Prometheus up to the side here, actually monitoring a, a number of these layers. We have Kubernetes operators that are managing the life cycles of those layers. Um, etcd in our API server is, again, that metadata information. Um, but now our user app is going, if we, if we kind of traverse the stack, we can see our user app talks to our CQL driver, which is just the driver within uh, your application, goes over the internet or a private link into Nginx. Um, you're connecting with a certificate bundle, so we can say, hey, this 
this request is coming in for this particular uh, tenant inside of our, our multi-tenant system. Um, we can make sure you're routed to the right location and that you have permission to access those resources. Um, from there, we use uh, OPA and validate that you have permissions to that particular table with that particular type of operation. Uh, and it, it goes down through Stargate. The live data that are on our actual uh, containers that are running and the various caches that they have. And then if the data isn't present on one of our data nodes, we can actually go out to S3, pull it in. Um, that doesn't happen that often. It's mostly just when you create a new instance. Um, and then the separate cleaners and then this regional service, which we'll talk about when we talk about the life cycle of a, uh, of a request. So the CQL is for request life cycle. So here we have number one, a CQL driver is coming in. It has a secure connect bundle attached to it, which is that, that SSL information I mentioned. Inside of that bundle, there's a number of certificates. There's a, tr a key store and a trust store. The driver knows, it's, in this case, we're talking about Java, so how to process the certificates and which ones to trust. That hits Nginx, and Nginx, the first thing it does is says, hey, is this a valid certificate, and who is it for? And we're just using SNI for that. Um, if you think about, like, so all this, traffic is happening over TCP. Um, if you think about a lot of the ingress that you see in Kubernetes, that's mostly HTTP, and you can provide a lot of context with headers. Uh, with TCP traffic, that's not really the case, except if you're using TLS, you can have that SNI field as part of the connection to do interesting things. In this case, we're doing some routing. Um, but anyway, from there, we validate the certificate. We say, hey, are you even allowed to talk to these services? Even though you have a valid certificate, is it for the services you're trying to talk to? Talk to? That'll go in and hit our Stargate layer. Stargate's pretty fascinating. I mentioned the API services and that it speaks native Cassandra, but it's also extendable. So we extended uh, the version that we're running inside of our serverless to reach out to OPA and do that validation. So it decodes the request, says, hey, this token is trying to do this read against this database and this table. And OPA says, yeah, good to go, or no, and that's not going to happen. Stargate, again, is all about the coordination tier. So it'll actually send the request to the data nodes that are involved with, uh, with that particular query. Um, it's not just one node, it'll be multiple replicas on multiple containers. Um, make sure that all that's correct. Send a message over to FluentBint, which we're using for uh, billing, to just say, this is the type of request that we run, a read, a write, what size it is. Uh, and then finally, that goes back to the end user, but I do want to highlight a number of the pieces that are that are shown here underneath S3, because previously all this was happening on those same nodes where you're running your queries. So if we think about the, the Cassandra node I showed in the beginning, it was doing coordination, it was doing data storage, but it's also doing this compaction, making sure that we don't have a bunch of uh, files on disks that don't need to exist there anymore. Um, because all our data is, is replicated out to S3, we can now have a out of band compaction process that does not affect the performance of our data or our coordination nodes. So that's one of the big tuning issues you have inside of regular Cassandra is you say, hey, how much storage throughput do you want to give your compactors? Because if you go too heavy on that, you're taking away resources from your ability to answer queries uh, and, and uh, ultimately affect your latencies for your end users. Well, by removing that from, the, from this CQL lifecycle at all, there's no way for us to impact the life cycle of a query. And when the compactor is done, S3 is updated, we can send a signal out that says, hey, nodes, if you have this, uh, if you're responsible for this part of the data range, go ahead and pull your new SS tables. They're ready for you. You can recycle these old ones. Um, and then separately, we have a cleaner service to, uh, again, look for data that is no longer relevant, that, that can be deleted, um, and updating the metadata. So. Here, the compactor is going to say, hey, I've made some updates, push it to the etcd server. That's going to get pushed back to the data layer. Data layer will rehydrate itself off, off of S3. Uh, the other nice thing about this infrastructure is as we scale out the number of data instances, uh, they're going to pick up freshly compacted data um, or, or whatever is, is currently relevant. They don't need to stream all the data from the other replicas that are online. Um, and that results in a faster uh, boot time for new instances, uh, which, as we mentioned, Elasticity is, is a big deal here. Uh, it's a little different from, from multi-region requests. We still do all those things we did before, uh, but now there's also this region service. So our data node here, A3, is going to go ahead and forward that request across the LAN to our remote region, uh, where all those things are. It's, again, going to hit the Nginx layer and then and go down and into the data layer inside of that 
uh, that region. Um, but we also have these uh, repair processes that are saying, and a region service to say, hey, if, in case you missed some of these queries, maybe a pop was going down or there was a hardware issue or whatnot, uh, we still push that information over the wire um, asynchronously to make sure that those remote regions are kept in sync. Um, and that's it. Uh, so if you're interested in checking out Astra, uh, it's at astra.datastakes.com. I've got a $200 credit. Uh, usually it's just $25 credit for, for the free tier, which is millions of reads and writes, uh, gigabytes of data. It's, it's kind of ridiculous what goes into it. it. It all depends on the size of your request and all that sort of thing. So I can't just say definitively it's this, this, and this. It's all about the type of application that's talking to it. But uh, feel free to check it out. And then I had a, a link earlier to the white paper that kind of goes into some of the more specifics as we develop this out.